Hello, everyone. A very good afternoon. Thank you for taking the time out and joining us on a Friday afternoon. I am Renal Shah, one of the portfolio managers at the Rotman Student Investment Fund. Uh, before we start, a few housekeeping rules. This event is being recorded. Kindly keep your microphones muted until, uh, until you have a question. Uh, this session is going to be interactive. Please post your questions in the chat and we will moderate them. Uh, last but not the least, we would like to see your pretty faces. It will be nice if you can please keep your cameras on. Okay, let's get started. Uh, we at the, the Rotman Student Investment Team is very excited to have Mr. Monish Pabrai with us today. Monish is the managing partner of Pabrai Investment Funds, which he founded in 1999. Mr. Pabra is an ardent disciple of Warren Buffett and closely follows Buffett's principles on value investing and capital allocation. I am personally very excited about this talk because uh, my first interaction with uh, Monish dates back to the early day days of the pandemic and I was truly inspired by his wealth of experience and knowledge. We have a bunch of aspiring value investors amongst us today. I am sure and I hope that all of you will feel the same after his talk today. A very warm welcome, Monish. Thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule and speaking with us today. I would now like to invite Sean Swift, who is one of the uh, founding members of RCIF, to give the opening remarks, after which the current CIO of the fund, Pomolo Rabana, will be moderating the questions along with McCoy Jackson, who is also one of the portfolio managers at RCIF. Over to you, Sean. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Good? Okay. Thanks, Renal. And Manish, thank you for taking the time. I can't say how excited I was when Renal brought this idea to the team. And you know, we had reached out to people at the Columbia Business School before, like Tom Rousseau and stuff. but. Uh, I definitely did not think we would get an investor of your caliber at some point presenting. So we really appreciate the time. Um, and, and so for the students on the line, I mean, really what you want to do today is focus on uh, generating questions to learn more about an investment process. So uh, at RCIF, obviously we're focused on doing high quality, deep fundamental research. And, and so I think Manish is one of the leading world's experts in in the field. And so take this opportunity to really dig in on how you can become a better analyst and uh, add value to the street once you get there. So Manish, maybe starting off, I mean, I'm curious and I'm sure people read up on this, but maybe if you could just give a little bit of background and um, maybe go into the story on the lunch that you bid on with Warren Buffett and then subsequently how that kind of conversation unfolded or how that interaction went. And for, for reference, students, um, the Oracle of Omaha himself has frequently noted Manish should be one of the best investors he's ever seen. So I know Manish will be humble, but you know, I think it's a two-way street here. Thank you, Sean. Yeah. So, you know, if we, if we lived, if we lived in the time of Newton or Einstein or Gandhi, and, you know, we had a chance to break bread, bread with them at some point, many of us would be, would be excited to do that. And, uh, I, and I, I had noticed that Buffett was willingly taking bribes to have lunch once a year with whoever paid the highest bribe. And uh, the bribe used to be relatively small. They used to run a, a charity lunch auction for the Glide Foundation in San Francisco, and they used to do it at the Glide annual gala so it was not online. And I think the, the late 90s, the lunches used to go for like 25,000 or something. And then Buffett had the smart idea to tell them to move the lunch online to eBay. And then it immediately jumped, jumped to like a quarter million. And, and I think the last year, I think 22 was the last year that he auctioned off lunch. And I think it went for, I think, north of 17, 17 or 19 million, I forget. So anyway, I mean, I you know, I've plagiarized and, you know, copied everything of my investment philosophy from Warren. And I think most of my net worth comes from that, all that cloning. So in, in 2007, I think my, yeah. my net worth at that time was north of like 80 million. 
And most of it was because of, you know, cloning Buffett. And so I said, you know, why don't I try to bid for the lunch? And why don't, you know, maybe 2% of that amount is a good tuition fee to pay. So like, you know, 1.6 million or something would be perfectly fine. And, uh, and I, I decided I was going to bid for the lunch. I had bid for the lunch a couple of years before that, but I had set like an upper limit of like, you know, 200,000 or whatever, and I would always lose out. So in 2007, I decided, okay, you know, we're going to kind of amp it up a bit. And, uh, and then my friend, Guy Spear, I asked him, he was the only guy I asked, because you can bring seven people to the lunch. So I asked him if he wanted to uh, join me on, on bidding for the lunch. And he said, yeah, you know, he was fine, but he wasn't fine with the 2 million. So he said he was good up to a quarter million. So I said, okay, you know, we'll cap you at a quarter million and I'll take care of the rest. And, uh, and so actually we, we won the lunch for like, I think about, about 650,000 and uh, which, uh, you know, most people thought was a little ridiculous, but now when I look back, it was like, you know, kind of, I think uh, kind of like buy one, get infinite free. So uh, the lunch led to a very nice friendship with Warren. He introduced uh, me to Charlie Munger and uh, then we met Charlie Munger for lunch. And then that led to a nice friendship with Charlie. And I usually meet Charlie probably four or five times a year for dinner at his place. And I used to play bridge with him on Friday afternoons at the LA Country Club. He doesn't do that anymore, but that for several years, whenever they were short one player or something, they would call me. So that was also a lot of fun where we would meet for lunch on a Friday and then spend four or five hours playing bridge. So yeah, so the lunch was terrific. I, I just had a very simple objective in bidding for the lunch, I really just wanted to look Warren in the eye and thank him. I didn't have any other agenda because I just felt so grateful for all the learnings and teachings that I had gotten from him and the huge impact he had had on my life. And uh, so everything else that happened was just gravy. And so the lunch with Warren, the first lunch with Warren went on for about, I think about three hours and we covered probably like, you know, I don't know, there were like 54 questions or something. So it covered a very wide range of things. In setting up the lunch, I had some interaction with Warren's assistant, Debbie Bozanik, who's a wonderful lady. And after the lunch, for a few years, Guy and I used to go to Omaha day before the Berkshire meeting, and we would meet Debbie for lunch. And so we had lunches with Debbie for a few years. And I thought, I thought the lunches with Debbie were better than the lunches with Warren. And, uh, and actually, the the first lunch with with Charlie, I also thought was a lot better than lunch with Warren, even though Warren is a tremendous lunch companion and we had a great time. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I think there was a, a lot of take home value with all of that, but just, you know, it, it spilled over in, into all these other relationships and meals and games and whatnot. So it worked out wonderfully. That's great. I'm sure there's a million follow-up questions everybody would like to ask, but uh, maybe we can get to those later. Um, last question for me, really, and you know, I'm I'm borrowing from from the the book that you wrote, the Dando Investor, and the the thing that we've tried to instill in the students consistently is a repeatable investment process. And so, if I can distill my interpretation of the book, it's buying quality businesses at the right price. And so, you've mentioned things like a moat or businesses with low competition, or uh, a, an experienced business, and then a margin of safety. Maybe if you could just highlight to the students a very simple breakdown of that investment thesis or philosophy and how you think about it. And, and maybe if that's changed over time through changing market conditions, maybe we start there. Yeah, sure. So I think I'll maybe I'll try to slice it a little bit differently. Buffett's letter, Buffett's letter came out recently, uh, last weekend. Some of you may have may have read it. If you haven't, I think it's a great read. It's one of his better read letters and it's, it's pretty short. I'll just read uh, two or three sentences from what he said, which I think yeah. you might find interesting. So he says that over the years, I have made many mistakes. Consequently, our extensive collection of businesses consists of, of a few enterprises that have truly extraordinary economics many that enjoy very good economic characteristics and a very large group, and not, not, I'm not a very large group, just and a large group 
that are marginal. And, uh, and then, you know, a little further down, he says, at this point, a report card on me is appropriate. In 58 years of Berkshire management, most of my capital alloc allocation decisions have been no better than so-so. So I'll just re read that question, <laughs> that sentence again, because this is, you know, the greatest investing mind in the history of humanity, you know, in 58 years of Berkshire management, most of my capital allocation decisions have been no better than so-so. Then he goes on to say, our satisfactory results have been the product of about a dozen truly good decisions. That would be about one every five years. And, uh, and then he goes on from there, you know. So basically, if you, if you look at Berkshire Hathaway, talking about the 58 year history, they bought around 80, 80 odd businesses as complete acquisitions over that 58 year period. And, and I would guess that over the 58 year period, he's probably invested in maybe north of a hundred stocks. It might be 120, maybe if you take two a year, it might be 120. So if you take, you know, to make it kind of poetic and even you have 120 stocks and 80 businesses. So you have 200 decisions basically that took place over a almost 60 year period. And he points to 12 that really are responsible for most of the outcome. And I think it's a lot more than 12 that were good decisions. But he also points out that they own a very large group of marginal businesses. So if we look at the 80 companies that he's bought, so you know, one of the things that Buffett doesn't like to do is he doesn't like to criticize specifically. Because I think like, so for example, if he said that Helzberg Diamonds was a terrible investment, Jordan Furniture was a terrible investment, it would really dissuade those managers, you know, to like make them feel bad. And you know, what, what is already a business that's struggling would probably have even more headwinds thrown up. So he, he would not be helping those businesses by highlighting that they were useless decisions. But actually, if we look at the list of businesses, which I think the list in the annual report, it's not a difficult exercise to go through and figure out which businesses are kind of mediocre or poor or useless and which are great or exceptional. I think in general, in investing, it is not that difficult to understand what is a great business and what is a not, not so great business. I think that usually if you look at the history of a business, what you'll find is that usually a great business is it'll be visible in the number. Uh, you'll have high returns on equity without the use of leverage. You'll have long runways uh, where they have the ability to reinvest capital at high rates. And, and you would obviously recognize just from looking at the names that this is a great business. So, you know, if you look at a business like Coca-Cola, or if you look at a business like Visa or MasterCard or American Express, or like, you know, flight safety, Geico, and so on, we, we, we can run into many, many great businesses, pretty obvious. So one of the, one of the things before I kind of go a little further on answering your question is maybe you can just help me because that might help tailor the conversation, is in your uh, student investment fund, what is the what are the investing rules? So what is the amount of money that you have to invest? And what are the rules that you have to follow? Yeah, absolutely. Fomalo, maybe if you want to take over from here as the chief investment officer. Sure thing. Thank you very much for your time, first of all, Manish. Um, at this point in time, we just started the fund. So we've got a hundred thousand dollars Canadian dollars to invest. We're gonna get $150,000 more to invest. And our position sizes, which is slightly different to, I guess, how you manage your money, is that we are limited to 5% initial investment. So that's a key thing. And then we're looking for companies which are compounding over time because we're looking for five, four to five year holding period. So those are the key sort of companies we're looking for. We're looking for modest leverage as well, businesses which are easy to understand and which we do expect to be able to grow the value over time. So the 5% maximum bet, bet size means that you would have at least 20 positions. That's correct. And the students who are managing the fund, 
are they involved in the decisions on managing the fund while they are students? Yes, that is correct. Um, it is the FAB executive team at this point in time. We have a team of 21 analysts and they're the ones who are involved in terms of um, looking for the stock pitches. And we actually have the final stock pitch coming up next month, uh, sorry, later on this month. And they're gonna pitch five or seven ideas. And then from those seven ideas, we're gonna pick the top five ideas. Okay, and then what happens to the positions after everyone graduates? Yeah, oh, so I can take that. So the the idea there is generally, so we're following the five by five model from Tom Rousseau at Columbia Business School. But the idea is the portfolio managers are responsible each year for taking over prior research committed on stocks within the fund. The 21 analysts are responsible for pitching either new ideas, supporting a current idea, and so, you know, Fomalo, Renal, McCoy, Harris, uh, and team are responsible for saying, of the five we bought last year, are there any that maybe we want to buy or sell, or buy more of or sell? Okay, so that means each, uh, each group picks five, is that correct? Yeah, give or take, yeah. Okay, all right, okay, that's pretty good. And are you limited geographically? All North America at this point in time. That's so sad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the regulators in the school actually asked us for the first three years before we build a full track record that we keep it in developed North America. Over time, however, the plan is to definitely kind of unleash the student powers internationally because Robin's actually a fairly international school. It's just, I think it's a strength. I think that, you know, when I, when I read this year's letter from Buffett and I thought about, you know, his, his, 12, his 12 great decisions, out of the 200, I would, I would say out of the 200, just outright mistakes where he lost a lot of capital would be very small. But a lot of, the, a lot of businesses which either flatlined or had some loss of capital was, would be a fairly large number. So one of, the, one of the important lessons that comes up from Buffett and his letter and his approach is what I would call you know, the circle the wagons approach to investing. So basically, Buffett has a incredible record in the sense that he has, you know, he has compounded at 19.8% annually for 58 years, which is two times the rate of the S&P, which is at 9.9%. And the 9.9% compounded for the S&P has led to a 24,700% increase in value. But the 19.8% for Buffett has led to a 3.8 million percent increase in value. So it's just not even in the same zip code. So even though he says that, you know, my most of my decisions are so-so, and, you know, when we look at those 200 decisions, we would not we'd be scratching our heads over many of them and many of them we would obviously say well i would have never bought it you know and uh, and such even with all of those warts and everything else thrown in the overall results are incredible and the reason the overall results are incredible is because the flowers were never cut and the weeds were never watered and and so that's a really important lesson here so what I what I mean what I mean by that and I and I think somewhere in the letter he brings up something about the flowers and weeds I don't know if I can find it on the fly over here but I'll see if I can find it later because he has he has some quote about 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 that so basically if I just switch gears a little bit in the in the early 1970s there was this concept of investing called the nifty 50 where the idea was that you bought these 50 tremendous businesses, equal weights, 2% in each. And you kind of set it and forget it. And you made a lot of money. And the idea of the Nifty 50 was that you really didn't care how expensive the business. It was a great business. You bought it. And, and so, for example, you know, McDonald's was in there and Procter & Gamble's in there, you know, Xerox and Kodak and all these you know, different businesses that were really kind of strong and powerful, IBM and so on at that time. And the Nifty 50 became so popular 
that those businesses businesses went into stratospheric valuations. And then in 73, 74, when we had the big, huge downturn in equity markets, the Nifty 50 got taken out back and shot, and very little was left of that portfolio. It was decimated. There is some, con- there's some controversy about whether Walmart was part of the Nifty 50 or not. There's one group of people who think that Walmart was part of the 50. There's another group of people who think it wasn't, but let's go with the side that thinks that Walmart was part of the Nifty 50. So if you bought the Nifty 50 at whatever ridiculous valuations it was trading at in the early 70s, and you went through the whole 73, 74 downturn and never touched those 50 positions, and you assume that 49 of those 50 positions went to zero, except Walmart, you ended up trouncing the S&P from 1970 to now by some significant margin. Like, you know, you'd be about like four percentage points over the S&P. So I'm taking $100. I'm lighting fire to 98 of those $100 and taking those to zero. I'm left with my $2 in Walmart. And my $2 in Walmart beats the pants off the S&P. And, and so that, that kind of data is somewhat in sync with Buffett's record. You know, the thing is that the, some of these investments he made are like holding Walmart for 50 years. They like that. You know, they just, they just had such powerful economics. There was a very good investor in India who passed away recently. He, he had a lot of health problems. He didn't live that long. He passed away when he was 62 years old. And uh, Rakesh Junjunwala, and he basically never managed outside capital. He didn't have any money when he started. He actually borrowed about, I think, about $10,000 from someone to buy a few stocks at 18% a year or something. He was paying that person. And, uh, and he didn't have any collateral when he was borrowing the 10000 The person said, how do I know I'm going get, to get this money back? He said, I'll put the stocks in your name so that you know, you know that you have those. And you know, I have the economic ownership. But if you know, things go to hell and I can't pay you, you, you have ownership of the stocks. And of course, he was able to pay him. But when Rakesh passed away, so he never managed outside money, never started a business or anything like that. When he passed away last year, at the age of 62, he was worth about $7 billion. And half of that $7 billion, about $3.5 billion, was one position. There's a company in India called Titan Industries, uh, which is a... A jewelry retailer and manufacturer. And about 25 or 27 years ago, Rakesh had put 4% of his net worth at that time into Titan Industries. And he was a hyperactive trader where he'd sit you know, with three screens and be in and out of all these positions all the time. But there were three or four positions he had that he never touched. He just kept them forever. And Titan was one of those positions. So if you do the same thing with Rakesh's portfolio, where you torch 96% of the portfolio in the mid-90s when he bought Titan, he still ends up with three and a half billion. And, and so that's very similar to the Nifty 50. So the lesson, I think the lesson in investing is that it is a very forgiving business. I mean, if you look at the Nifty 50, you could have been wrong 98% of the time, 49 out of 50 times, and you still did okay. Now, you wouldn't have done okay if you danced in and out of Walmart stock. Wouldn't have worked. And in the last 50 years, nobody held Walmart stock. Nobody held Walmart stock for the entire 50 years, except the Walton family. And, and so here was this great business. It was obvious it was a great business. It was doing well. It was embryonic. It was going like crazy. And uh, people didn't hold on to it. And, and so the, the key with investing, in my opinion, is not so much that we won't make mistakes. We are destined to make a ton of mistakes. It's just the nature of investing. John Templeton said the best investment manager will be wrong two out of one out of three times. 
probably more likely will be wrong half the time. If you look at the 200 bets Berkshire made, I would say probably a good 100 would be mediocre or poor and still didn't matter. But the concept that matters a lot is the concept of circling your wagons. So you don't really know a business till you invest in it. And it really takes you a few years of ownership to really understand the business. You may have some ideas about the business before. Um, it's when it drops 40% in price after you buy it, that's when you get a real education of what the business is actually all about and what it's worth and everything else. Your analysis will be extremely good at that point. It won't be so good before you buy the business, but it'll be really, really good when it drops 40%. You'll be amazing at it. So the important thing is that all of us will find ourselves in the happy situation every so often of holding a small interest in a great business. And when that happens, what you need to think about the portfolio, you need to think about the portfolio in the form of a few concentric circles, okay? So at the very center of the circle, with a bunch of wagons circling around, if you go back to Rakesh Junjunwal, is Titan Industries. And the next round of positions with a bunch of wagons around it would be bets that he has less conviction on. He might have like three or four others that he feels pretty good about, but not as good as Titan. So he puts you know, there in the next circle. And then you might put the next set of positions in the next circle. So one of the things I would encourage you to do is that the portfolio you're inheriting, try to see if you could put them in those different circles. And so we want to make sure that the business or the businesses that we have that are just tremendous go at the center. And the center actually needs to be a very rarefied space. So it's not enough for the business to be great. You know, like I said, it's very easy to tell. I mean, if I look at the S&P 500, probably 200 of those 500 businesses are great businesses. You know, they wouldn't be in the S&P 500 if they weren't great businesses. So for me to look at the S&P 500 and pick out, you know, which are the best businesses. And in fact, even to even just rank them best to worst is a very trivial exercise. It doesn't take much to do that. That'd be pretty easy to do. What would be a much harder exercise is which of the businesses will do the well, do the best for an investor from today onwards. Because not, when, when a business is great and the markets recognize it as being great, then a lot of those future pro prospects are discounted in. And so when you become the 201st first analyst to buy that business, you know, what are you bringing to the party? You know, it's possible you have some insight that the rest of the world missed. But if, if these are, you know, widely followed, well understood businesses, those become difficult and rare. So, so for the innermost circle with the most precious cargo being circled by the, you know, tightly formed wagons, we need, we need two or three things. We need a tremendous business. We need a tremendous business which has a tremendous growth runway, which has very high returns on equity without using leverage, which has the ability to reinvest capital at very high rates, and which has a very modest price. The last one is the deal killer and the most difficult because everything else we can find relatively easily. And, uh, and, and the last one is why, you know, Munger says, we need to go fishing where the fish are. And he also, I think a few weeks back, there was a daily journal annual meeting, I think about two, two weeks ago. And he was talking about, you know, the, I think he was asked a question about the, the single 
biggest flaw a lot of humans have and the biggest flaw humans have is is denial a lot of investment managers have denial you know where they are they are going up i mean if i if i am given a mandate to only buy s&p 500 names and beat the s&p by 5 percentage points a year and i decide to you know and i need to have at least 20 names in the portfolio you know i shouldn't even try that would be really hard to do but a lot of other managers will try that and that's what munger means by denial so with that maybe we'll see what else you guys want to talk about so well, thank you very much um just going back to great businesses um I read somewhere that you think only about 5% of companies globally are actually great businesses. So I just wonder whether or not how you define a great business might be different to other people. And also at the same time, perhaps there were learnings that you went through your investment process or decisions that you did make that actually made you think twice about what actually is a great business versus what is not actually a great business. Can you perhaps just take us through some of the mental models that you use to actually make sure that what you are investing in is actually a great business? Yeah, that's a great question. So one of the hallmarks of a great business would be durability. And one of the issues with capitalism is that if you have a mousetrap that delivers high returns on equity, grows a lot, does really well, et cetera, you have a target on your back. And other capitalists will try to come and take market share from you, make the the landscape far more competitive, reduce the profit margins, and even take you out of business. And the reality is that most of those marauding invaders coming to take the castle will succeed. So if we look at how many businesses last 10 years after they have formed, how many businesses last a year after they are formed? It's a very small number. 10 years is an even smaller number. 20 years, even smaller. Each time it's going down by a whole exponential, you know, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, just keeps going down. If we go look at the kind of the Dow Jones Industrial Average from 100 years ago to today, and you look at, you know, the kind of 30 most powerful businesses 100 years back, it used to be only GE was the one that came through. And then now GE is gone too, you know, taken out back and shot many times. And so basically a business, I mean, if you look at a business like IBM, IBM is a very interesting case study because they were able to morph and evolve and jump curves cur- curves many times when they should have died. You know, when, when mainframes switched to mini computers, switch to PCs, switch to client server computing. Through many of those curves, IBM just kept plowing through, kept doing well. And, and now it's a shadow of its former self. And, yeah. and uh, investing in IBM hasn't been a pleasant exercise for maybe a couple of decades now. So, so One thing we have to understand, so if we go back and look at, okay, the oldest business in the world that I'm aware of is about 700 years old. It's a very small boutique hotel in Kyoto, Japan, which is in the 36th generation of the same family running it. And so, you know, when we get to about three or 400 years or 500 years, you're left with, you're basically left with liquor companies, you know? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Liquor companies are great businesses, by the way. Tobacco company, you know, human vices. If you invest in the vices, you do well. So basically, when we talk about great businesses, we have to talk about them with great humility. Because even if we look at a business like Apple today, which absolutely dominates and is so entrenched, Alphabet, Amazon, Microsoft, dominant, well-entrenched, deep mort businesses, high returns on equity, just tremendous. Which of these will be with us 20 years from now, still thriving? 40 years from now, still thriving? 
60 years from now. I don't know if I would make a bet that any of them will be surviving 40 years from now. 40 years is a long time. 10 years, I don't think you can touch any of them. I think they're all solid for 10 years. 20 years, maybe they're all still there. After that, who knows? So one of the problems we run into in investing is on one hand, I told you, circle the web. You know, you find this great knight, you know, controlling this great castle with a great moat around it. Just hang on to it for dear life. And then on the other side, we have this, you know, permanent, you know, creative destruction going on, where even your most precious crown jewel numero uno bet just gets decimated, you know, taken out back. So this is why you know, like Charlie says, why should it be easy to get rich? You know, so this is what makes it challenging. So what what we have to do is we have to circle the wagons that we have to do because without circling the wagons, you don't get to hold a Walmart for 50 years. But the second thing we have to do is we have to separate signal from noise. So what we have to do is these businesses will go through ups and downs. Nothing is straight forever. And so when they go through, sorry, when they go through these ups and downs, we have to separate normal cyclicality, you know, whatever's going on, such as life from secular decline. And we cannot be like, you know, trigger happy. And when we are, we can be a little sloppy on the selling. So we, we can see, or oh, something is declining, but let me be absolutely sure they're not reacting to the noise. So that's fine. You can, you can be a little bit careful on that. But when you are absolutely convinced that some castle is in permanent secular decline, you then have to put the wagons around something else and, and uh, move from there. And, and those are not easy things to do. But uh, that's why you guys get paid the big bucks. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, you mentioned tobacco, you mentioned beverage companies or alcoholic beverage companies. But when you look at a company like Anheuser-Busch or BTI, they've pretty much done, or have, they haven't performed very well, should I say, over the past several years. So even though they are great businesses, they haven't actually been great investments. So what's your sort of um, view of the disconnect in terms of them actually performing? Wow. Yeah, that's a that's a great question, especially a great question to ask a teetotaler, and uh, and so I'll, I'll I'll give you my best shot, having never had a bud before. Basically, I I I I haven't really looked at those businesses, but I would I would say that you know obviously we've had some change in taste, you know where things have moved to the hard seltzers and so on. It all tastes horrible to me, but you know some things taste less horrible than than some. Some other things. Just to take a, a a little detour is, I, me the teetotaler, had an investment in a liquor company in in China called Mao Tai, and uh, I'll just tell you the story about Mao Tai for a second, and then we'll get back to Anheuser Busch after that. So Charlie Munger, when I when I got to know him, he insisted that uh, Lee Lu and I should meet each other once a month for lunch. So I told Charlie, well, you know, if Lee Lu wants to waste his time with a yo-yo like me, I'm more than happy to do that. And uh, so when I was in California, now, now Lee Lu has moved to uh, Seattle. Do most of you know who Lee Lu is? Most people don't know who Lee Lu is. So I'm like barking up the wrong tree. So let me go a little further back to first explain Li Lu, and then we'll get to the Chinese liquor, and then we'll get to Anheuser-Busch. And hopefully all that will happen before it's all pumpkins and mice. But going back, going back a little further, because there's some lessons in each of this. So Charlie Munger said that he read Barron's for nearly 50 years. You know, I think all of you know what Barron's is. And so Barron would show up every week at his home and he'd read it. And each issue of Barron's probably has at least, you know, five or 10 stock ideas, probably at least 10 different stock ideas. They, they have different write-ups and people are, you know, talking about different businesses and all that. And so 
if you take each balance issue having 10 ideas and you have 50 issues in a year, you have 500 ideas in a year. And then if you go 50 years, it's 25,000 ideas. So Charlie says that for 50 years, he he read Barron's. He read all these 25,000 ideas and he never acted on them. Okay. And then in 2003, after 50 years of reading Barron's, he reads one idea in Barron's that really excites him. But suddenly Charlie is seeing something in this write-up, which he could not see in the previous 25,000 write-ups. And he had about $10 million of loose change lying around. And he put the 10 million into this company that the world thought was going to go bankrupt. It was Teneco, it was an auto parts company. So the bonds were very distressed. The bonds were down to like 20 cents on the dollar and the stock was very distressed and the whole thing was very distressed. But Charlie somehow was super excited about it. And he put 10 million into Teneco. And then about three years later, the 10 million had turned into 80 million. Okay. Well done, Charlie. Well done. Okay. And then Charlie decides to take the 80 million, give it to this Chinese guy that he's met once to manage for him. And the Chinese guy who he's met once is Li Lu. Okay. So I asked Charlie, I said, hey, Charlie, you meet this guy from China one time, okay? And you take the 80 million, which is a little more than loose change now, and just give it all to him. Why would you do that? So he said, well, Monish, it was a no-brainer. I said, why was it a no-brainer? He said, because I just looked at the guy's track record. So Li Lu was a student leader in Tiananmen Square. And he was one of the main instigators of Tiananmen Square. And the Chinese government basically wanted to hang him at high noon and be done with him. And so somehow he managed to escape to Hong Kong. And then a bunch of you know, Chinese you know, dissidents in Hong Kong helped him come to the US. And he got admitted to Columbia University. And Columbia admitted him into three programs at the same time. So he did three simultaneous degrees at Columbia. He did an undergraduate degree in physics. At the same time, he did a MBA at Columbia. And at the same time, he did a law degree at Columbia. And when he entered Columbia, he spoke no English. And the university basically gave him a free ride because he came with no money. So, you know, they said, okay, you know, we'll fund you. And, and so what they used to do is like, let's say there was, you know, $20,000 of expenses for the semester. They would give him the 20,000, then he'd pay the fees and, you know, have money for his living and all that. The float on that, on the money they kept giving him every quarter or every semester, he started to invest that. So like, for example, he's got money in January and it doesn't need to be paid to the landlord till March. You know, we got two months of float. That's a long time, okay? So he invested that two months of float. So by the time Lilu finished at Columbia with near the top of his class in all three degrees, he had converted that float money into a million dollars, okay? So, and, 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 and then Charlie said, I just looked at what the guy was doing. And to me, it was a no-brainer. So he gave 80 million to Li Lu, which very quickly Li Lu turned into 800 million. And I think now that money that Charlie gave to Li Lu might be sitting at like 1.2 or 1.3 or 1.4 billion or something. So now that we know what Li Lu, who Li Lu is, and when Charlie says, Monish, you should have lunch with Li Lu, I told Charlie, if he wants to meet the yo-yo for lunch, the yo-yo is very ready to meet him. And so I used to meet Lilu once a month for lunch, okay? And I told Lilu, look, so whenever I meet somebody for lunch, I don't drink alcohol and I don't smoke, but I do like great food. So I said, Lilu, listen, near your home is Din Tai Fung. 
Have any of you heard of Din Tai Fung? A few nods, that's awesome. We have a few nods. It hasn't come to Toronto yet, but it'll come soon. In the meanwhile, whenever you go to other cities, you can have Din Tai Fung. Anyway, there was a great, it's a Taiwanese dumpling place. So I said, listen, while we are having great conversation, we'll meet at Din Tai Fung once a month. He said, yeah, that's fine. So I meet Li Lu one time and he's telling me about this obscure Korean company called Amor Pacific. Okay. And, and he's trying to explain there like the cosmetics business, this and that, whatever. And I finished that lunch. I went back. I tried to look. Everything's in Korean. And then I found some places in California which carried their products. And I went to those stores. I could not make out head or tail of this business. Okay way outside circle of competence. So I said, okay, whatever, aim or whatever. And then after about 18 months or two years of meeting, he tells me, yeah, so, so did you invest in aim or aim or Pacific? I said, Lilu, I couldn't make head of it. He said, it's gone up 600 X. Okay. So then, then Lilu tells me, you know, Monish, you should buy Mai Tai. I said, Lilu, you know, I'm done with these wacko names. So here's what we're going to do. Don't tell me go buy this and go buy that. Please spoon feed me everything I need to know. Because when I leave this lunch, everything in Mao Thai is going to be in Chinese. And then I won't be able to do anything. And then I want to meet you after two years and it's gone up 100x. And I'm again the idiot who did nothing with it. So he said, Well, you could have asked me that about Amo. I would have explained it to you. I said, Well, now I'm asking. Please explain, spoon feed me Mao Thai. So Mao Tai is the most, uh, now it is the most valued liquor company in the world. It's above every other liquor company. It only has one product. Okay. The product costs about $1.50, less than $2 per bottle to make. And the last time I checked, it was about $1,400 per bottle that they sell it for. So like a 99.9% like operating margin. And so... I asked him a bunch of questions about Mao Tai. It was very obvious this was a remarkable business and it actually had gone down in price for temporary reasons. And I made an investment in Mao Tai. And then and Mao Tai instantly started elevating, moving up in price. Life is good. And, and I told Lilu, if you want to take the lunches to twice a month, to. In fact, if you want to meet me every day for lunch, that's also okay. He said, we'll keep it to once a month. I said, okay, that's fine. You know, and, uh, and uh, so a few years after that, I uh, decided that the Mao Tai had become such a big part of the portfolio that maybe I should go visit the company. So I, I made a chip trip to China and Mao Tai is in the middle, very obscure, remote area of China, which nobody would ever go to. And my friend Guy Spear came with me and my daughter came with me and we went to Mao Tai headquarters. And because Lee was a big shareholder and he helped set this up, they had arranged a great banquet for us at the Mao Tai Museum, you know. And so at the banquet, Guy Spear's with me and my daughter's with me. So Guy Spear tells the host, we don't want you to get offended. But my friend Monish here does not drink alcohol. And is it possible to get him a Coke? So they said, within this hallowed ground of this restaurant, there are only two liquids that are served. It's water and Mao Tai. And we would be offended if he did not consume Mao Tai. So, you know, it's if you ever get a chance to have Mao Tai, you know, tiny serving like this small, you have it neat. It's like diesel going straight in. It's like concentrated diesel. That's all I can describe it as. And I didn't want to offend the host, so I took one sip. And then my insides were burning for the next three days. So that was my experience, my one and only experience with with liquor. But anyway, coming back to Anheuser-Busch. So I think the thing with Anheuser-Busch is what we'd have to know is we have these kind of 
changes in human tastes and trends, is that noise or is that signal? It still has a dominant position. It's still a great business in many different ways. We have to look at the valuation. We've got to have some idea of what it might do in the future. And then if all of that becomes at the point of being a no-brainer, like Teneco was for Charlie, then we pull the trigger. Otherwise, we move on. So that's all I can say about liquor. Cool. Thank you very much. Um, I guess just to follow up, when you actually meet in management teams, for instance, um, how do you go about assessing the difference between a good management team and a bad management team? And I say that because usually when things are going well for a company, everyone says this is a fantastic management team. They say they do fantastic work, X, Y, Z. They're futuristic. They're thinking forward. But when suddenly things do turn for that management team, people start calling them naive. They're not really focused on what's the most important thing for a company. So I want to know how you actually go about differentiating between what actually makes a good management team versus a bad management team. Warren has given us the framework on that. So that's pretty straightforward. We simply look at the track record. So all management teams have one thing in common, especially all CEOs. They got to be CEO because they're great salesmen. Okay. And so if you go meet a great salesman and he talks to you about a subject on which he knows everything and you know nothing, and you rely on that information to make decisions, you will not get to nirvana. You will get to the poor house. So basically, the average public company CEO, you know, being male and thereabout, would be someone you'd be happy to have your daughter marry. They are high quality, high integrity people, but they are optimists. And if they weren't optimists, they couldn't lead. So it's not like they're trying to mislead you. They actually believe the Kool-Aid that they're trying to sell you. It's just that the Kool-Aid may or may not be real Kool-Aid. So the way to look at a business and to look at a management team is to look at what they've done in the past. And if you, if you go back and look at what they've done in the past, then it becomes very obvious. And also, sometimes you might be confused was the past great because the business was great or was the past great because the manager was great? And, you know, who was this? Who was the, British, uh, in the, the American general Patton? Patton used to always say that he didn't want his, the officers, no, it was Napoleon, sorry. Napoleon said he was not looking for his generals to be great. He just wanted his generals to be lucky. He said, I want the most lucky generals. I don't want the great generals. Okay, so when we look at the past history of a business under a given manager, did the business do well because the manager was great? Or did the business do well because the business was great? Like if you look at a business like Coca-Cola, for example, we know for a fact that for about 35 years or 40 years, it was managed by idiot managers. And the business still did well, in spite of the idiots trying everything under the sun. You know, they bought Paramount Pictures. They bought shrimp farms in China. They bought all these stupid businesses, which when the next team came in, they sold everything, okay? They did all these stupid things. They couldn't kill the business, okay? So when we look back and we see great performance, it now doesn't matter what we think of the manager because more than likely that great performance is mostly due to the quality of the business versus the quality of the manager. And so just like Napoleon, we want lucky generals. And so forget what the manager is saying, forget what he's forecasting, forget what mumbo jumbo tales they're spinning for you. That's all hocus pocus. All we care about is what's happened in the past. And what's happened in the past is not subject to debate. It's very obvious. So it becomes pretty simple and straightforward. Thank you. Um, Muka, you want to ask a question quick? Yep. So thanks, Manish. Just turning to a few questions from the chat uh, from the students and other participants. Uh, so this one is a bit of a segue into what you mentioned about um, finding great businesses. So uh, 
The question is, after you've identified a great business, what's your approach to valuation? Um, I know you hate Excel models and uh, fine tuning those models. So what sort of mental models do you use for value companies? And the second question from the chat is on one of your commandments um, to look for the hidden PE uh, within your companies. Uh, what, what's your approach to, to that? Um, and then how do you go about, as a related question, how do you go about assessing the normalized earning power of, of companies you're looking to invest in? Yeah, so what we want to do is we don't want to use a lot of brain cells because we have limited brain cells. So we want what I would call no-brainers. And, and uh, like, you know, I started making trips to Turkey about five years ago. And uh, in about two weeks, I'm going to Istanbul for about two weeks. And it should be quite the orgasmic visit. But, but basically, I started going to Istanbul about five years ago, just out of curiosity, because it was a screening as probably the cheapest market I was I'd ever looked at. And Turkey has very crazy economic policies, 80% inflation. Everyone and their brother has exited, you know, and uh, local investors are gamblers. Their average holding period is like, you know, six hours. And uh, so I started meeting with, I have a good friend in Turkey. I told him to just, if he would be, just take me to the businesses that he already invested in, which he was very happy to do. And in my second trip to Turkey, I ran into this company that he was taking me to where the market cap was $16 million. And my friend was telling me the liquidation value is like 700 or 800 million. So I asked him if it was a fraud. He said, no, I own part of the business and it's a perfectly normal business. And I looked at the business and I really couldn't find anything wrong with it. I liked the people running it. And I really was kind of scratching my head about the valuation. And then I thought it's such a nano cap. What am I going to be able to get for, for this? But for about seven or $8 million, I got one third of the company. Now that market cap is about 350 million and yeah. liquidation value is around maybe one and a half billion. It's, it's a company which, what was exciting to me about that business was that it was trading at less than 3% of liquidation value, which is very good for your health because that's a straight 30X if liquidation value never increases. And, but they were reinvesting capital at such high rates, 25, 35% a year in dollars, that I knew that that liquidation value was going to go, you know, asymptotic. And uh, so I, I tried to buy as much as I could. And then I said, we need to circle the wagons. So I put it at the absolute epicenter that when everything else is sold, we would still hold on to. So I was only able to invest 1%, a little over 1%, maybe one and a half percent of my assets under management into RESAS because it was such a small, you know, like $8 million or whatever. And now it's approaching like 25%, 30% of the portfolio, something like that. And so there was no need for Excel. We could look at, it was like, you know, 12 million square feet of warehouses, 80 bucks a square foot kind of replacement value. That gives you about 960 million, 200 million of debt at the time. That's 760 million and a 16 to $20 million market cap. You don't need to do much more math than that. If the warehouses are there and percent lease and inflation index leases, and Amazon is a tenant and Carrefour is a tenant and Ikea is a tenant and Toyota is a tenant and Mercedes is a tenant and DuPont is a tenant and none of those tenants are going to default on their rents or try to bail out of the leases or anything like that. So what we, now something like Resas, you know, I know God loves me, but I know he only loves me enough to give me one of these in my lifetime, one and done, you know? So it's not like he's going to make me, you know, he also showed my tremendous love, right. the tremendous love for me by putting me in front of Lilu for lunch. And then he also made Lilu tell me about Amor Pacific, but 
then what god did was he took me he took the horse to the water expecting the stupid horse to drink and the stupid horse was too dumb to drink the first time and uh, so what we want to do which is difficult for you to do in your fund is we want to do what i would call anomaly based investing we want to do invest in things which make no sense if it makes sense don't invest in it so like mark twain says you know truth is stranger than fiction because fiction has to make sense we want to invest in things that don't make sense and when they don't make sense that's when we've got a shot at greatness and definitely excel is not going to help you make sense of something that doesn't make sense it's hard to break away from the excel models <laughs> So I have, I have another know, one. You know, you know, the thing is that there's a AA program for people who have an <laughs> Excel addiction. You you start by going to the meetings and say, I'm McCoy and I'm addicted to Excel. And then we'll all say, Welcome, McCoy. <laughs> and then the healing will start. I might sign up. <laughs> <laughs> so I have another one here from from the chat, and this one is around um, Buffett's, I guess, famous approach of your circle of competence. Uh, so the question here is: Aren't you concerned about things outside of your competence, great investments that you might be missing because you're sticking to that circle that you understand? Yeah. So it is really important to not stray outside your circle of competence. So the size of the circle is not relevant. You don't need to understand very many things. You know, I hate the defense sector. I don't like companies where there's only one client and the client is the government. Okay, I hate the healthcare sector because in the US it doesn't operate with market forces. There could be great investments in the, you know, defense sector, great investments in the healthcare sector. you know moderna might be a great home run etc cetera, etc cetera. but they don't fall within my circle of competence so that's perfectly fine so don't have envy or oh, i should do this or someone else understands this or my idiot neighbor is becoming really wealthy because he bought you know salesforce or whatever i think you really have to the problem is if you invest without conviction you will not be able to hold the company and you will also not be able to separate the signal from the noise so really important that you understand the business well because understanding the business well will help you decide is this something that i need to hold forever or is this something that i could possibly replace with something better and so on so i i think there is no substitute for circle of competence charlie munger has a billionaire friend who passed away recently john ariega and the interesting thing is john ariega's daughter is uh, is married to mark andreessen so you know she's already a daughter of a billionaire and then she you know randomly chooses to date a billionaire and and then it's billion to the power of a billion and you know i've lost count of the billions now so anyway john ariega basically only invested in real estate within 2 miles of the stanford university campus and he never he never went beyond that he did not invest in northern california real estate or bay area real estate or california real estate or new york real estate or toronto real estate or any of that and if you were walking with him around the stanford campus he could tell you the history of every building he could tell you what the rents were what the price was what everything was and basically when people became very pessimistic about real estate around stanford he would load up on these com- on these businesses people became very euphoric over these things and they were bid up to crazy levels he unloaded 
And, you know, he did that a few times and he ended up with, you know, several billion dollars. And, you know, he knew, he didn't understand anything about Anheuser-Busch. He never understood anything about Mao Tai or Amor Pacific or, you know, going to Turkey or anything else. All irrelevant to him. So I think sticking to circle of competence, there's no substitute for that. One of the most important things to do. And all of you, when we start out, our circle of competence is very narrow you know, because we haven't had a lot of experience. We can only really understand products that we've used in the past and a small sliver of them, we could probably understand the economics, but that's okay. Over time, the circle will expand naturally. We don't really need to worry about it. But even if it doesn't expand, like it never expanded for John Ariega, it never really expanded for Sam Walton. Every entrepreneur for the most part has very narrow circle of competence. You know, they're a inch wide and a mile deep. And that's how they succeed by being an inch wide and a mile deep. So we want to be, we want to really make sure that the bets we make are businesses we really understand. Well. Thank you very much. Um, we're coming close to time. Just wanted to ask you a quick question. Um, going back to your multi-bagger approach where some companies you want to hold for dear life, You've mentioned that you only want to sell it when it gets egregiously overvalued. So what's the difference between egregiously overvalued and being greedy? Like when do you know when to sell off? Well, you would, you would want to basically make that decision when it's a no-brainer decision. So if you are confused about it, it's not yet time to sell. So it's like you couldn't, you couldn't possibly justify that valuation no matter what, you know, no matter what kind of, you know, rose colored glasses you put on, you can't justify it. You know, I had, I had made an investment. This was one of the first investments I made when I started investing in 94, almost 29 years ago. And at the time I was running a IT services company in Chicago and I made this investment in this IT services company in India called Satyam Computers. And I knew those people. They used to come and meet me in, in Chicago periodically. So I knew it was, it was a good company. I knew they were growing really fast. And then I looked at their valuation at that time. India was very undervalued then. Just the real estate they owned in Hyderabad exceeded the value of the business. And this was a IT company that was growing like 70% a year and, you know, huge margins and everything. So I, I didn't put much. I think I put about $10,000. At that time, I didn't have much money. I had about a million dollars. So about 1% of my portfolio, really small. $10,000 went into this company. I basically said, it's one of the businesses I understand well. It's got a very long runway, all these things. I'm really not going to look at it. And in that time in India, they didn't have a DMAT. So I got physical share certificates sent to me which I just stuck at the bottom of my drawer and I said, okay, we'll open this when I'm a much older man, see what we want to do with it. And I just didn't really follow the company much. And I noticed when the dot-com bubble was raging in early 2000, about five, six years after I'd bought the company, that it had gone from 40 rupees a share to 7,000 rupees a share. It was trading at a like a 150x currency that went against me. So it was 150X in dollars. And I looked at it at that time. I mean, I knew their business was doing well, but there was no way to come up with a valuation that would fit no matter how optimistic I was. And so I said, as much as I like this, we got to let this go. And, and, I, and, I, and I was also very skeptical about the whole process of sending the certificates back. And I didn't know whether the Indian government would allow, allow me to repatriate the money. You know, they said in theory, you can take everything back. But I said, I only gave them 10,000 and I'm going to, you know, pull out 1.5 million or something. And they're going to like choke on that. And uh, so I wasn't sure it'll all go through, but it did. Everything went through and I sold within 10% of the peak. And about nine months later, it had dropped 85%. Still would have been a good home run, but that was, that was my first 100 bagger. And uh, so life was good. And so far, I've only had 200 baggers. I shouldn't say only, even one is good. And 
possibly with the one in Turkey, we'll have a third one. That'll be the most the most fun, I think, because it's, it'll have the most meaningful amount of capital in it. So basically, when things get to total no-brainer territory, that it's just completely egregious, that's when you're at. You're on mute for a moment, but I'll, I'll take the last one from, from the chat before we close. Uh, this one is, a, uh, I guess, a more macro sort of question, but it is, it involves your investment thesis or your investment approach to your Chinese investments. Has has it changed? Has it has it evolved? Um, given what's happening with the fundamentals of the Chinese economy. Yeah, I think I think China is a for me. I think it's a difficult place to invest. I I think that we only have a, really one investment. I mean, we still have a tiny amount of Alibaba left, which is. Uh, which is a mistake, but we have one investment, which is in the South African company called Process, but in effect, it's an investment in, in Tencent. I mean, we still own it. I think Tencent, Tencent is a very remarkable business, but there are aspects of that business which are difficult for someone like me to figure out with how the Chinese government thinks of them and all of that. It's also a mega cap. You know? One of the issues is there's a law of large numbers. So if I want to focus only on 100 baggers and, you know, Tencent has a $300, $400 billion market cap, you know, to get 100x, we're looking at 30, 40 trillion. And, and uh, there are no 30, 40 trillion market cap businesses anywhere on the planet. Uh, they cap out at about 5% of that number currently. So that's the other thing. We, we may do okay on it. If I find something better, I would switch it. Cool. Thank you very much for your time today. I think that brings us to the closure of the event today. Um, we do thoroughly appreciate you taking so much time to actually speak with us today. Um, we've learned a lot. and I've learned a lot. I'm sure our owners have also learned a lot. We're looking forward to seeing how they put their learnings into practice in a few weeks' time when they do their final stock pitch. Um, we'll see if they have DCFs or not, but we'll see how that goes. And then, um, obviously, um, it says a lot about person when they take time out of the day to speak with us when they have no reason to do so. So it does mean everything to us that you did actually take time today to speak with us. Um, we're highly appreciative. And we do look forward to continuing this relationship with you. And we wish you continued success. Um, looking forward to more talks and all the best for future endeavors. All right. Well, uh, thank you very much. I very much enjoyed the session and some great questions. And I'm sorry for the long-winded answers and the detours, but hopefully you got something out of it. And I wish you all the very best. Thank you very much. Right. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Manish. Bye. Yeah.